Those of you who were here last week know that we, we began talking about, of course, a difficult and rather grim subject, the subject of uh, abortion, a uh, subject that's difficult but important for us as the church to deal with, to grapple with. Um, if you weren't here for that, the presentation, the audio, is on our website, the church website. If you didn't have a chance to hear that, or if you want to hear it again. Uh, the, also, the PowerPoint slides that went along with it have been posted by Keith on the website. So if you want to refer back to that, you can, uh, to sort of review some of that material. We laid, we laid a foundation last week in terms of things like man being made in God's image, when does God permit the taking of life, What's under what circumstances, generally speaking, um, how the moral content of the Old Testament law is still relevant to us as the church in the gospel, and that the moral law is universal, uh, extending to all people in all places and all times. And so, so those, so those were some of the things that we talked about. So we're gonna we're gonna continue on today with that. We'll begin by uh, praying on this Sanctity of Life Sunday, as we not only reflect on this dark subject, but we do celebrate the gift of life that God has given to all of us, to whatever extent that is, and however long that is, it is a gift. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are life eternal. And when you raised Lazarus, you said that you are the resurrection and the life. We give you our deepest thanks that you've come to defeat the powers of evil and death. To live forevermore because of you. And even the darkest of sins, the one we're talking about today, and we're going to be reflecting upon the past, what the people of Israel did to their own children, that your gospel is deep and wide enough to forgive the darkest of our sins. We ask that you would heal the church and heal our land and move our hearts to do what is right with gentleness and grace. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I have one more housekeeping item, and that is, it occurred to me that perhaps a lot of times when I present in Sunday school, I try to put in too much material and I don't give a lot of time for questions. So what I thought I'd do was just hand out scrap, some scrap paper, and as questions arise, since sometimes time is limited, and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes hard to raise your hand and ask a question, um, you can write down a question about this subject that comes to your mind or has come to your mind, hand it in, and then part of next week, we're going to finish this subject. It's actually going to go into a third week. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity of my third teaching week. And if it works out, uh, I'll try to answer some of the questions that have been handed in. So, uh, Marty, would you mind helping uh, pass these little scraps around? And then just at the end, if uh, Pastor Manny, would you mind collecting the questions at the end? I like saying that, Pastor Manny. All right, so as we're doing that, that'll afford you the opportunity to uh, really ask anything you like. Uh, whether I can answer the question, it gives me a week to figure out if I can answer the question, too. So, our clicker is. Not clicking. Oh, there we go. So, a couple of uh, things that came up in my mind as I was thinking about last week. Uh, one was a, a verse that I had forgotten about when we talked about uh, life in the womb. And that is this verse from Genesis 25. I completely forgot about it. And, and uh, someone brought it to my attention, and I thought, oh, this is... This is This is absolutely perfect. It fits right in with what we're talking about. And this is about Jacob and Esau. Um, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children, plural, struggled together within her. Struggle. 
life, right? Struggling. They're wrestling inside of her womb. And she inquires if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to ask the Lord, why why are my children wrestling in my womb? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the nut. The younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb, meaning Jacob and Esau. So we see here not only what we called last week a continuum of human identity, right? From conception until death, the person, no matter what stage of development, is human, fully considered image of God from the beginning. And here we have these twins wrestling. Only that which is alive wrestles. And there are also nations. Think about all the children that have perished as a result of abortion. What the future consequences may, in theory, have been. How many cancer doctors there might have been to to maybe find a cure for cancer. Or how many... Whatever it is that they could have been, they're not. Or never had a chance to be. Now that's a little theoretical when you think about it, but if you, if, if you think about it in, in positive terms, all of that life gone. And here we have two nations represented by these two infants wrestling in the womb. Kind of gives you a picture of what could be or could have been. One item I misspoke on last week that I wanted to correct, and that is this, this prohibition in Exodus 21, which refers to two men getting into an altercation. They accidentally hit a woman who's pregnant, and the child comes out. I said that the passage was translated as miscarriage. That is incorrect. The, the, the way that it, the passage is written, it is not miscarriage. It is the child comes out. And the way the law is written is, if there's no harm, that means the child survives. Then the men who are in this altercation pay a fine. And if there is harm, meaning the child dies, then the men pay with their life. So, uh, it is not a miscarriage that we're talking about in this verse. That's a mistranslation. There's a couple of translations that have that. But I wanted to correct that because I didn't want to leave the impression that, oh yeah, you know, you just pay a fine if you cause a miscarriage. No, it's if the child comes out and survives the altercation. So I just wanted to bring correction to that. It was very, very important. And then the third item, just for review, that as a general survey of the Scriptures, and I, you know, it was just impossible to get into all the details of this. You You could do this for several sessions about the taking of human life, what, what I see as your teacher here, and, and uh, be as the Bereans, and search the Scriptures to see if these things are so, okay? I, I, as any teacher, I don't speak infallibly. Uh, I do f- feel that this, as a general reflection of what the Bible teaches about the taking of life, uh, the circumstances are primarily under the, f- under the heading of human government. Capital punishment... And in the history of the church, the church has reflected on what we call just war theory. When is a is warfare justified? And and but even if one takes a pacifist view of that and says it's never justified, that's uh, that's even a it's not really relevant to the question of abortion per se, because that's an individual scenario. Uh, Just just war has been vigorously debated in the history of the church. But the point is, is that the church has reflected upon this and that there are certain circumstances where it feel that war is just. The only circumstance that I have been able to find in Scripture where it's justified for an individual, not under the authority of government, to take life is in the issue of self-defense. Uh, extreme circumstances. In the Old Testament law, you'll read, you know, some scenario unfolds, somebody enters your tent in the middle of the night. And you can imagine how horrifying that is. It's just like somebody coming into your house. There's a certain dimension to that kind of altercation that could lead to the death of that individual because there's a threat to the family. 
And it's not to justify the taking of that life in all circumstances. If the person is subdued, then their life is not to be taken. But the point is, is you really can't find in Scripture any warrant for outside of gov- the authority of the government for us to take life. So it's very, very, very limited in terms of the circumstances that God allows this. And for good reason. Um, for good reason because of the passions and the sinfulness of man. So those are some things for you to reflect upon. Um, we can't flesh all of that out today or in our mini-series here, but those are some things for you to think about. So now we're going to move along, and hopefully I'll, I'm going to bring uh, to the conversation and to my presentation, and hopefully of some interest to you in terms of history and apologetics and archaeology is this rather strange practice in the Old Testament that we read about called child sacrifice. Uh, And I'm going to show you from some of the archaeological evidence that's been uncovered, evidence of this, which shows us the reliability of the Scriptures that these practices that the Bible reports are found in history which isn't a surprise to most of us, right? And so your homework assignment was to read Psalm 106. It's rather long, and if you weren't here last week, you didn't have the opportunity to read through it, so if you have a chance this week coming up, I invite you to do so. And what I'm going to do this morning is we're just going to peruse through Psalm 106 a little bit. Again, it's rather long. Uh, It's... Fairly typical in some ways of reflection in the Old Testament. The central event that is almost always looked back to by the biblical authors is the Exodus. The faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of the covenant people of Israel. So I'm going to read through brief sections. I'm going to read all of it because it will take quite a bit of time. And then we're going to get to the verse that's pertinent to our discussion where Israel kind of reaches rock bottom, if you will. So if you'll follow along with me in your Bibles, Psalm 106. Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord, or fully declare His praise? Blessed are those who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people, come to my aid. When you save them, that I might enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that you, I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. So this exalts God and His goodness and His mercy to the people of Israel. Now, it begins to go one after another, the sins of the people of Israel, what they've, what they've done. We've sinned against you as our, even as our fathers did. When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your kindness. Yet He saved them for His namesake. He rebuked the sea. He saved them from the hand of the foe, meaning the armies of Egypt. The waters covered the armies, but they soon forgot. Verse 13. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. So He gave them what they asked for. He sent a disease. In the camp, they grew envious of Moses. Remember, they tried to kill Moses and Aaron. The earth swallowed up. Uh, the earth opened and swallowed Dathan. Verse 19, at Horeb they made a golden calf. They exchanged their glory for the image of a bull. Idolatry. They forgot God, 21, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham. So he said he would destroy them, but Moses stood in the breach, a type of Christ Moses served as. He interceded for his people. They despised the pleasant land. They did not believe His promise. Verse 26, He swore to them with uplifted hand that He would make them fall in the desert. 28, They yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to lifeless gods, idols, idolatry again. They provoked the Lord to anger with their wicked deeds. Moving on down by the waters, 32, the waters of Meribah, they angered the Lord and trouble came to Moses. 
Now, to verse 34, and where it's most relevant for our purposes and for our teaching these couple of weeks, they enter the land of Canaan. They're instructed by God to destroy the people in Canaan as an act of judgment against them and as a means of taking over the land. But they did not obey God. They mingled with the nations and they adopted their customs. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. They defiled themselves, and they prostituted themselves. Very stark language. It goes on to say how angry the Lord was with them. And here's, this is the bottom of the psalm. This is the bottom. Now, the Israelites have gone as far and as dark as you can go. And God sends judgment upon them through the arm of the Assyrian army and then eventually through the Babylonian Empire. He hands them over to the nations and their enemies oppress them. And on it goes. But the end of the psalm... But he still took note of their distress when he heard their cry. And he remembered his covenant. Even though the people of Israel were faithless, God was faithful because there was a covenant that was unconditional and that was the Abrahamic covenant that laid behind all of it. So he still remained faithful. Down to 47. Save us, O Lord our God. Gather us from the nations. We may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, obviously, this passage is relevant to our discussion, but I thought theologically and in terms of history, we're looking at the people of Israel and we're looking at what happens to the covenant people when they give themselves over to the spirit of the age, of the idolatry of the age. What happened to their moral compass and what happened to their minds that they were willing to do exactly what the Canaanites, what the Canaanites had been judged for by God, the Israels became the exact same thing. And God did to them, through judgment, exactly what He had done to the people of Canaan. And so, it's really fascinating because in the New Testament we know this uh, reference to demons, it's all over the place, particularly in the Gospels. Jesus comes and sort of draws the poison out of the, womb, uh, the, out of the world, doesn't He? Right? The demons show up everywhere because they're scared to death. It's the Son of God has come. But in the Old Testament, the word is only used twice. Only two times we see the word demon. And both contexts, it's in the context of this practice of child sacrifice. And it reminds us of what Paul says. I wonder if... He may have had this in mind. We seem to be stuck. There we go. What pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God, I do not want you to be participants with demons. Paul knew the spiritual realities that were behind all of these kind of pagan practices. He's not talking about child sacrifice in the context of 1 Corinthians 10, but it's very fascinating that the language is very similar. You wonder if he had this in in the back of his mind somewhere. So only in two places in the Old Testament is reference specifically to demons. Now we see reference to Satan, the serpent in Genesis 3, Satan in the book of Job, but not demons per se. Very interesting. And so here's a number, just a number of verses. I'm just going to survey this very quickly with you. Of verses in the Old Testament from the time of Moses all the way down to the time of Jeremiah that refer to this, to us seems this strange practice of sacrificing children. Uh, Here, uh, Deuteronomy 12 refers to what the Canaanites do in the land. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Do not come even close to doing what they do. Because this this is what they do. Can you imagine the Israelite hearing this going, we're not, we're not going to do that. What are you, crazy? That's, these, these people must be completely corrupt and depraved. And yet, over time, the people of Israel do exactly that. They become the Canaanites in a sense. Here we go, all the way down to Jeremiah. This is 700 years later. 
They built the high places through the middle of the, the verse here of Tophet. I'll explain that to you in a moment. Which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Now, a Tophet in Hebrew is a, it means literally a place of burning. It's, uh, it could be used to refer to a crematorium, but in the context of Scripture, it's always referring to this practice of child sacrifice. So when the, the, the sacrifice occurs, as you think about animal sacrifice, of course we read through the Old Testament, the animal is killed by the priest and then burned in the fire. And this is what the Canaanites and the Israelites did to their children, putting them up to false gods. In the valley of the son of Hinnom, this is outside, right outside the gates of Jerusalem, this is taking place. Here we have a re- reference even to the kings of Israel engaging in this activity. So not only do we have people doing this practice, but actually the kings of Israel endorsing and participating in this horrific activity. Ahaz burned his own son as an offering in the fire. Second Chronicles 28. Here's a view of the valley of the son of Hinnom right outside the city of Jerusalem. And here's a view of, uh, of the Temple Mount from the time of Jesus. You can see on the south side there is the Hinnom Valley where this is where this took place. What's fascinating from a linguistic standpoint is from Hinnom is where we get the word in the New Testament Gehenna, which is hell. And so the word is derived from Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley. And even though the Scriptures don't put us all together, I find it very ironic and very fascinating that Jesus speaks of hell, Gehenna, and this is the place where the people of Israel sacrificed their children to demons. Fascinating fact of history that that word became associated with eternal judgment and fire. Here's another reference. 2 Kings 17. Seems a little redundant. But, you know, we skip over these verses and they, because they kind of seem strange to us. They burned their sons and the daughters' offerings and provoked the Lord to anger. Now circling back, all the way back to Leviticus, we kind of just did a sweep of history, 700 years, really quick, of different verses. Here's another version of the, what I call the formula. There's different ways that it's written in the Old Testament. You shall not give any of your children to Molech. This is a Canaanite deity that specifically is associated with what we're talking about, child sacrifice. It's even mentioned in Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. And now here, um, here's a, a prohibition given by Moses warning the people of Israel, do not engage in this practice. Even if someone who is not an Israelite who lives in the land engages in this, they are to lose their life, to be put to death. Okay? And God will cut them off, so forth and so on. Leviticus 20. But it goes on to say, this is fascinating because you don't see this too often in the Old Testament law. And if the people in the land close their eyes to this, in other words, if they turn away from it, they say, uh, we don't, just don't want anything to do with that, then they're also culpable and responsible for their indifference towards doing this. So God takes this very seriously and holds those who are accountable around the people of Israel accountable for it. So it's a corporate sin, right? People of Israel are responsible in some way. It's connected to the individual in some way. So I thought I'd share with you also a fascinating discovery from the world of archaeology you may know or heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's considered the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. Uh, In the 1940s, they discovered uh, scrolls of the Old Testament that were 2,000 years old and older in caves around the Dead Sea. The oldest manuscripts of the Bible ever discovered. Thousands of fragments, sometimes complete scrolls, like the scroll of Isaiah. It's about 60 feet long when it's rolled out. It's really incredible discoveries. 
But as I was doing research on this a few years ago, I accidentally discovered that they had actually discovered a fragment of Leviticus 20, this prohibition against sacrificing children to Molech. And so, being the geek that I am, I had to take a look at it closely, and I was able to find the references right there where it says, to Molech. Very clear. 2,000 year old uh, biblical scroll discovered at that time and preserved providentially by God for our study. Shows very much the preservation of Scripture over many, 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 many centuries. These scrolls are very important discovery. It's written in an old script. And so, um, a very important archaeological discovery confirms going back 2,000 years the stability of the transmission of the Bible. And here's just a black and white version just so you can see the lettering a little bit better. And so, in summary, as you do a a survey through these uh, verses in Scripture, it's sort of over a period of many centuries, there is a mixture of formulas that are given in the text Uh, refers to high places. This is sacrificial places uh, that the Canaanites sacrificed animals to and to their gods. Um, The Tophet is the place of burning. Uh, Fire, Molech, and Baal. These are all different terms that are used in the Old Testament associated with this practice. Uh, It's occurring over many centuries of time. So God has been patient with the people of Israel over many centuries given them opportunities to repent and to turn away, sent prophets to warn them to stop doing this to their children, to, uh, to committing uh, this great crime against God, against uh, humanity, really, and engaging in this kind of idolatry, a very dark, insidious uh, practice that they were ensnared in. And, of course, Psalm 106 connects it to, ultimately, demonic activity. And that's for us to bear in mind, you know, the spiritual battle that we're in. That's what the Israelites were in. They were deceived by spiritual beings, in part. And so that's always, we know that as the church, that we engage in a battle. We're not Joshua. Uh, We're not an army, a physical army that goes into a land and fights the battles of the church physically. We fight it spiritually, don't we? And so it's always a reminder to us of this, this activity is always behind opposition to the work of the gospel and the work of the church um, and our individual lives. There's a conspiracy. There really is a conspiracy. Um, uh, one which God will completely destroy at some point in history, but in time, it's our job to fight that battle, not with swords, but with prayer and with faithfulness to God's covenant. So over a long period of time, we see this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on a, little, a quick journey and show you just a little bit from the world of archaeology how there has actually been discoveries of this terrible practice found from the ancient world. And so we're going to begin here. On your, the map on the right is Israel. On the left is what scholars called Phoenicia. It's just north of Israel. Um, the Phoenicians were a very advanced culture. Uh, But the Phoenicians didn't call themselves Phoenicians. They were actually Canaanite. That was their cultural heritage. And when the Israelites sort of pushed them out of the land, uh, they were already living north of Israel, but um, they kind of reestablished their own civilization there because they had lost a lot in Israel when when they were pushed out. And they were known as maritime traders. They had a highly advanced culture, and they went all across the Mediterranean Sea. So when you read online, or you ever hear on TV about the Phoenicians, it's really Canaanite. This is the Canaanite culture. And they went all the way over into the western part of the Mediterranean, all the way down into about the 8th century, over to Spain and North Africa in particular. Now, this seems very distant from the biblical lands, but I'm going to make the connection for you here in a moment, because the Phoenicians are Canaanite. They took with them 
their cultural practices when they colonized in the Western Medi and Central Mediterranean. Um, particularly, their empire became known as the Carthaginian Empire. This was the city that they established in North Africa. This is modern-day Tunisia, where it sticks out in the sea in the blue there. It comes up close to the boot of Italy, you'll see there. So this is North Africa, um, modern-day Tunisia. It's 1,400 miles from Israel, which seems quite far, but it's culturally very close. And so here are what modern scholars call tophets. These are places that have been uncovered by archaeologists where modern scholars are convinced that this practice took place, child sacrifice, and there's evidence of it there. And they've called them tophets. And the evidence is overwhelming for this practice. In particular, we're just going to briefly sh show you here in a moment some discoveries from Carthage, where the arrow is these various places in the Western Mediterranean. So here's a picture of the funerary monuments, gravestones, if you will, dedicated to Canaanite gods, two of them in particular, Tanit Ashtart and Baal Hammam. You'll recognize uh, a couple of these names in a moment from the Scriptures, particularly the book of Judges. And so here's a typical stela, what is typical of it is at the top is this moon crescent-shaped figure, Baal, Hammam, and Tanit is the arm. It's a female deity, and the moon deity is male. They come in partners together in most of these inscriptions. And we see here a connection between these two in Judges chapter 10. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, they serve the Baals and the Ashtoreth, variation on the spelling, but it's the same God. So we see here in the land of the Bible, has traveled all the way across the Mediterranean to the empire of Carthage. Here's another stela from Carthage that's been uncovered. You can see similar design, the arms out, the moon on the top, representing the two gods. Here's one all the way down to the second century. This is the time, just before the time of the New Testament, hundred or so years. So, uh, very persistent in the, in the type of drawings. Here's an inscription, an actual inscription written in Canaanite script to Tanit, the face of Baal or Baal, to our Lord, to Baal, that which was vowed. And what that means is whatever is buried under the stela is what was vowed to this deity. So, was sacrificed to this deity. Here's another one. You see the hand on the left side, a little different, and the triangle on the right, and at the top you can see the moon, the crescent moon figure. Here's a burial urn that was discovered there from the 5th century B.C., very similar to urns found in the land of Israel. And here we have a close-up on the right, 7th century B.C. urn, and when the lid was taken off, bone fragments and remains of an infant that had been sacrificed to Baal, Hammam, and Tanit at the Tophet at Carthage. This is just one. In a period of about 20 years of excavation in a very small area, archaeologists found over 20,000 of these urns with the remains of these precious small children. Now some people have said, well, maybe this was just a cemetery. Maybe it's just a place where, you know, small children died. Small children died a lot in antiquity in the old in the ancient world. But uh, extensive scientific studies have been done on the teeth fragments particularly. The bones have been exposed to great temperatures, so the skulls and the and the other bone fragments are hard to figure out how old the age profile is. But the teeth, because of the enamel uh, has been some of it's been preserved enough. The age profile is consistently zero to six months, so it's not a cemetery because you would have a wider range of ages in these burials. Twenty thousand of them discovered, and that's just what the archaeologists have found. That is a small sampling of uh, the number that have been discovered there. Very gruesome 
work. Um, no matter how often I've studied this, it, it just causes this great pause in my spirit to think about, think about this, to think about how long this, ago this went on. It is a verification, though, isn't it, of not only the propensity of the evil of man and the first forces of darkness in the world, but how accurate the Scriptures are in describing things that happened in the past. So we have some evidence closer to the homeland. It's not, we haven't found uh, archaeological evidence of a tophet in Israel, but we have ancient authors, a number of them, who testify. Here we have this Greek author who says, yeah, the Phoenicians, and particularly the Carthaginians, they sacrificed their children. Um, we just abandoned them out in the woods, but these crazy uh, Carthaginians, they sacrificed them. It's kind of a strange moral argument that some of them make. Um, here's some more evidence from, and we'll wrap up here, an inscription found at the city of Sarepta, biblical Zarephath. And there's great irony in this discovery because there's this inscription discovered that reads Tanit Ashtart on it, which is the Canaanite deity, the Carthaginian deity to which um, the uh, children were sacrificed. And it is in the city of Zarephath that the prophet Elijah raises the widow's son from the dead. So one of the great ironies of this discovery is here we have evidence of worship of this God, this God of death, And in the very same city, the God of life comes through the prophet and raises this son from the dead. Sort of the irony of the biblical picture of who God is versus what false gods bring. They bring death. And they bring destruction. And they bring horror. And here's one more discovery from the city of Hatsur from 1200 B.C. This is one of the oldest images. This goes all the way back into the time of the judges. You see the two hands lifted up and... The moon shape. So you see this deity throughout the Mediterranean and particularly the evidence uncovered at the city of Carthage. There's a picture. Uh, Similar, just reminding you of the hand and the moon picture. This is the oldest discovery that I know of that has images of this particular God. And here we have, this is from the time of Judges in the city of Hatsur, which was a huge Canaanite city that Joshua conquered and then Deborah and Barak conquered in the Judges period. So, just to show you some of the cultural uh, evidence connections of all this. Um, so we see, just quickly in summary, not surprising, what man and His wickedness can do to even the most innocent among us. And how it's gone on for centuries. And it's been repackaged in different ways, but it remains the same. And that is, culture of death persists through demonic activity and through the darkness that's in the world. And we are obligated as ministers of the Gospel, to strongly and unapologetically oppose this darkness in prayer and in the preaching of the Word and the faithfulness of the way we live. Now next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring all of this together and show you parallels. Because some of you might be saying, well, okay, I go, a person, not I, excuse me, a person goes into a clinic and they have an abortion and they kill their child, child dies. Over here, we have the sacrifice going on. It's a God. This has nothing to do, I mean, this is, this is not a God. This is not some kind of religious practice. It, this is a medical procedure or whatever the rationalization. I'm going to bring all of that together next week and show you how the parallels are actually very close, especially spiritually. And this last image that I'll share with you before I wrap up in prayer is something I, that it, it, just, it just sort of carries with me whenever I, I haven't presented on this subject in a couple of years. This was found in a stela at Carthage. 
And here's a... Um, this is a priest taking this baby to the altar to be slaughtered and cremated in a fire. And so here we have almost a picture, if you will, of this happening thousands and thousands and thousands of times in Carthage in the ancient world. And this motivates me as a, as a minister of the gospel and as a teacher and as your friend and as a fellow believer to get on my knees and pray that God will move us to oppose this, this image that you see. Here is what goes on 3,000 times a day in our own nation. And so, we ask God to be merciful and to, be, to move so that we as the church can be faithful to Him so that we don't become like the people of Israel, right? And so, like I said, next week we're going to bring all this together. I, I want this image to affect you in some way, to motivate you. And we're going to talk about that next week. What can we do as the church that's faithful to the gospel? What are the things that we can do in our prayer, in our life, in our witness to make a difference? Just one of those babies, if we could just save one of them, it would be worth whatever it is, whatever we have to do. And that's where my heart is with this. Um, I pray that God will move you in such a way to do what he calls you to do on this. Even if it's praying, that can be the greatest thing you can do. So let us finish in prayer. And remember to hand in your questions. Again, the last thing I'll say, I know I'm going over. I know this subject is dark, and I'm taking you into a dark place. But next week, we're going we're gonna to go to the place of light. I promise. And that is that God's gospel is great enough to save even this. Let's pray.